Today's episode of A New Beginning is brought to you by Harvest Partners, helping people everywhere know God. Learn more at harvest.org. And while you're there, browse our library of free ebooks designed to help you grow in your faith. The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But Pastor Greg Laurie points out the challenge of that message. You know, people will talk about anything. Oh, I believe in this, and I believe in a little bit of that, and I believe in some of this other thing where I just made up a bunch of stuff, and this is what I believe now. Sort of like an ABC religion. ABC, anything but Christ. How do we reach a culture like this? How do we tell them about Jesus Christ? This is the day when the lost are found. As believers who want to share our faith, sometimes it would seem we're attempting to deliver a message many people just don't want to hear. They think they don't need to hear it. Well, the truth is, everyone needs the hope of Jesus Christ. Today on A New Beginning, Pastor Greg Laurie reminds us God built us with a hunger for God. People may try to feed that hunger with the things of this world, but sooner or later, they'll come to realize their hunger is for something more. Let's grab our Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 17. The title of my message is, How to Reach Our Culture with the Gospel. So there was an an event that was being held, and a minister was asked to come and share just a few words, which sometimes is challenging for preachers, because we can be long-winded, right? So the preacher got up to speak, And he quickly went to us a lot of time, which was five minutes, and he was continuing to speak, and now it's eight minutes, now it's nine minutes. So there was a moderator there. He cleared his throat, hoping the preacher would hear and stop. Still the minister droned on. Then the moderator lightly tapped the gavel to get the preacher's attention. Still this preacher kept preaching. Now it's 20 minutes, and it's ruining the entire event because they have other things that are going to happen. And now the moderator pounds down the gavel loudly and still the preacher is speaking. Moderator couldn't take it anymore. He took the gavel and threw it at the preacher. It barely missed the preacher and hit an elderly man who had fallen asleep in the front row. The old dude woke up, saw the preacher was still speaking and then he said to the moderator, hit me again, I can still hear him. We've all heard that preacher. And sometimes we've been that preacher. Oh, not behind a pulpit. But we're the kind of person that when we come along, people want to go in the other direction. Because here comes you or me with our message and it's the way we deliver it that drives people crazy. So let's take a master class from a master communicator. The Apostle Paul. Let's take a page out of his playbook on how to reach our culture with the gospel. And so Acts chapter 17 is the story of Paul bringing the gospel to the city of Athens. At this time, Athens was sort of waning from its former glory, but it was effectively the cultural and intellectual center of the world. It was the base of the great Greek philosophers like Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and many others. Their thoughts and teachings still impact uh, many today, as a matter of fact. So Paul's just sort of hanging around in Athens, and he does what you would do when you're in a city like that. He went sightseeing. I've been to Athens. Uh, We went there uh, as a part of a tour to Israel and walking in the footsteps of Paul. And I've actually spoken on Mars Hill where Paul addressed these people. And so he's just checking things out. There's the great Parthenon, uh, a temple built to one of their false gods. In fact, there were false gods everywhere in Athens. It was said it was easier to find a god in Athens than a man. Uh, It's estimated there were at least 30,000 altars erected to various Greek deities like Zeus, who was the king of all gods. And there's Athena, the goddess of heroic 
behavior, Epaphrodite, the goddess of love and lust, Morpheus, the god of dreams, Poseidon, the god of sinking ships. No, not really. That was <laughs> some movie about the Poseidon. Forget it. That was actually the goddess of uh, storms and earthquakes. And then finally there was Nike, the goddess of shoes. We know that for sure. Okay. <laughs> so all these various deities were there. And so Paul just kind of taking it in. He's walking around the city. He's absorbing the culture. And now he begins his message in Acts 17, starting in verse 16. We read, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. When Paul was waiting for them at Athens, he was deeply troubled by all the idols he saw everywhere in the city. He went to the synagogue to debate with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and spoke daily in the public square to all who happened to be there. And he had a debate with some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. You might underline that. I'm going to come back to it. Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. Then he told them about Jesus and his resurrection. And they said, this babbler has picked up some strange ideas. Others said, he's pushing some foreign religion. Then they took him to the council of philosophers, also known as the Areopagus, and said, come and tell us more about this new religion. You're seeing some rather startling things and we want to know what it's all about. It should be explained that the Athenians as well as the foreigners in Athens seem to spend all of their time discussing the latest ideas. I'd underline that. It's interesting. Underline that. So Paul, standing before the council, addressed them as follows. Men of Athens, I notice you're very religious. If you were to give this statement today, you would say, a people of America, I see that you're into spirituality. That's effectively what he was saying. And I was walking among your many altars and one of them had this inscription on it to an unknown God. You've been worshiping him without knowing who he is and now I wish to tell you about him. <laughs> That's a powerful text and we'll stop there. You know, we live in a unique time in American history. I would say the days of cultural Christianity are over. What is cultural Christianity? Well, there was a time in the late 50s, early 60s, when many Americans would identify themselves as a Christian even if they were not. Church attendance was much higher. Biblical values were reflected even in television programs like Father Knows Best and Leave It to Beaver and things like that. There was sort of a respect for certain bedrock values that is not the case today. Our culture today is more biblically illiterate than it has ever been. It's shocking how little people know today about the Bible. Uh, there was a time in our public schools where the Bible would even be taught as literature. Not as the book given to us from God, but at least telling people you need to have a, a general understanding of Scripture. No, those days are gone as well. So our culture, our nation, is a lot more like Mars Hill than any other time. Mars Hill was the place where the philosophers would speak and trade in the latest ideas of the time. They were a completely secular culture. We're becoming more of a secular culture. There were two primary uh, streams of thought at this time. The teachings of the Epicureans and the Stoics. Epicureans and Stoics. And people still believe in these philosophies today. Let's start with the Epicureans. They believed in the pursuit of pleasure. Sound familiar? Uh, their belief was there was no order really to the universe. There's no God, no absolutes, no future judgment. So you might as well live for the moment. They were effectively the party animals of the first century. Their philosophy would be, hey, we're all gonna die, so let's just eat, drink, and be merry, and enjoy the moment. I think our modern equivalent would be the playboy philosophy. The pursuit of hedonism, casting aside all absolutes or codes, and just do whatever you want to do. And we all know people, and some of us used to be these people, who live for pleasure. You live for that buzz. You live for the rush. You live for the experience. You live for the excitement. It reminds me of going to an amusement park where you spend a lot of time waiting in lines. 
And then you get on the ride, and the ride's over so quickly, and then you go and get in another line, right? And some people spend their entire life waiting to get on the ride, waiting to have the pleasure, and there's a deadness to all of it. As the Bible says, she that lives for pleasure is dead even while she is living it. It's been said, the cure for hedonism is an attempt to practice it. And that is why so many people who become rich and famous, especially quickly, burn out. Or they find themselves addicted to drugs or alcohol. Or you hear that they're into their second, third, fourth marriages. Or they're taking their own lives. Because they have chased after their dreams and they've realized their dreams. And sadly, in many cases, their dreams have turned into nightmares. Living a life for pleasure is in reality a pleasure-free life. So those are the Epicureans. Then there's the Stoics. They were more disciplined. They believed that God was in all things. God was in nature, God was in the trees, and in the ocean, and in the sky, and in the animals, everything. Sort of a new age belief before it was called that. So this is the audience, if you will, that Paul is addressing in his day. As verse 21 says, they spent all their time discussing the latest ideas. Sort of like an ABC religion. ABC, anything but Christ. Pastor Greg Laurie will have the second half of his message in just a moment. Hey everybody, I want to encourage you to join us for something we call Harvest at Home. It happens every Sunday at harvest.org and on our brand new app, Harvest Plus, which is available on your mobile TV devices. Download it now and you can watch Harvest at Home with Christians from around the world as we worship together and study God's Word. So again, join us for Harvest at Home at harvest.org or on Harvest Plus. Well, today we're discussing the challenge of reaching our world for Christ. Pastor Greg's message is titled, How to Reach Our Culture with the Gospel. You know, people will talk about anything. Oh, I believe in this, and I believe in a little bit of that, and I believe in some of this other thing, where I just made up a bunch of stuff, and this is what I believe now. And so here's Paul now with this challenge that's not unlike the challenge you and I face every day. How do we reach a culture like this? How do we connect to people like this? How do we tell them about Jesus Christ? Because really, as the Bible says, there's nothing new under the sun. Ecclesiastes says, history merely repeats itself. It's all been done before. Nothing under the sun is truly new. Is How true is that? It's just a repeat of it in a new way. Malcolm Muggeridge once said, quote, all new news is old news happening to new people. Right? So things are not as different today as you think they are. I think these first century principles apply to us in the 21st century. So how can we be better communicators in the time in which we live? Point number one. Effective communication begins with a burden. Effective communication begins with a burden. Look at verse 16. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed that the city was full of idols. He was greatly distressed the city was full of idols. The word used here for distressed means seizure, spasm, or outburst. So this is a visible reaction from Paul. You know, if you're upset by something, someone might say, hey, you don't have a seizure, man. <laughs> Paul was kind of having a spiritual seizure. He, he was just grieved to see the absence of the living God and in his place every conceivable substitute. And I wonder if you ever feel that way. I know I do. You know, when, when I look at a news site, I, I, it's so frustrating to me to see the evil in the world, the horrible things that people do to people, uh, the, the wrong ideas that people fall for, the tragedy of so many human lives. And then we look at all these idols, all these false gods. I would say for us today, for us, celebrities are false gods. You know, what are they up to? What's the latest thing? What did they just post? Oh wow, look at how they look here. And they're using all these filters. They don't even look like the people they are. And I think people sort of put these people on pedestals and these ideologies, etc. But I want you to remember something. 
And when you look at people doing godless things, they are not the enemy. The devil is the enemy. I think we forget this sometimes. And sometimes even in, in our world of politics, you know, we get really worked up. They're so evil. They're so bad. Okay, hold on now. Here's what the Bible teaches. They are a sinner under the captive of Satan. Now granted, they're doing evil things. And what they're doing is wrong, but we're not supposed to hate sinners. We're supposed to love sinners. Hate the sin, sure, but love the sinners. Don't forget, Jesus was called the friend of sinners. Second Timothy 2.26 says, Pray that they'll come to their senses and escape from the devil's trap for they've been held captive by him to do whatever he wants. Don't forget, you used to be one of them. How were you reached? By someone yelling at you? By someone hating you? No, I'm sure it was the love of God that got through to you, right? Someone show God's love. <laughs> Satan is the enemy. Sinners are not the enemy. They're they're under his control and we're praying that they'll be set free. You know, it's interesting that phrase that Paul uses, therefore people being held captive, it means they're caught alive. Caught alive. The only other time that phrase is used in the New Testament is when Jesus says, follow me and I'll make you a fisher of men, or a better translation would be, follow me and you will catch men alive. So here's the choice. They can either be caught alive by the devil, if you will, are caught alive by Christ through our evangelistic efforts. And I think we often sort of want to withdraw from culture. Culture is evil. I don't watch TV. I, I don't go online. I don't go to movies. I, I, I only go to Christian restaurants and I eat Christian food. <laughs> and I have a Christian pillow. And Christian slippers. And I listen to Christian radio and only watch Christian television. Okay, no, it's fine to have these assets out there, but we need to reach the culture that we're in. Paul went into their world. The Areopagus, Mars Hill, was sort of the town square. He just went right there in the epicenter of everything. He said, hey, I was walking around your city. I was checking things out. And I saw that you have all these gods you worship, but there was one altar erected to the unknown God. I think the idea was, hey, in case we miss one God, let's just erect this to the God we missed, right? I want to talk to you about the God you don't know about. Bringing me to my second point, Paul was culturally relevant. He was culturally relevant. It's called reading the room. Paul quotes one of their secular philosophers to build a bridge to his audience. He says, I want to talk to you about the unknown God. I notice that you're very religious. Or as I said, we might say today, you're into spirituality. So, you know, this is a great way to start. And I do this all the time. Um, you know, I do this when I preach. I do this one-on-one. -on -one. I try to find a, a little bridge to walk over with the person I'm speaking to. Uh, I have a book called uh, Lennon, Dylan, Alice, and Jesus. Now I know that's a weird name for a book, okay? So, you know, I've done some other biographies on Johnny Cash, Steve McQueen, Billy Graham. So this one is about these rock stars that are known by many people and what happened in their lives spiritually. And this co-author I work with uh, and I were able to dig up some really interesting things about people that are in the public eye who actually encountered Christ. Uh, I'm not saying all of these people are Christians. Some of them are, some of them aren't. But basically my premise of this book is to show that no one is beyond the reach of God. So here, here's, um, like John Lennon as an example. Of course, part of the Beatles. And everyone thinks John Lennon was the most anti-Christ guy that ever lived. Because after all, he wrote the song Imagine. Imagine there's no heaven, uh, no hell below you, above you only sky, etc. He said, we're more popular than Jesus, uh, speaking of the Beatles. Well, some things happened toward the end of Lennon's life many people don't know about. And that was a moment in his life where he actually professed faith in Jesus Christ. Now granted, it did not last, but I explore that. What actually happened to this guy? And there's a lot of other things in there that 
you'll learn about people that have come to Christ. And I also deal with present day pop stars as well. Many of whom have made professions of faith. I start the book with these words. There will be three surprises when we get to heaven. Number one, some of the people we thought would be there won't be there. Number two, some of the people we never thought would be there will be there. Number three, will be there. So, because sometimes people misunderstand, I think, when I do things like that. Why are you talking to that person? And why, why are you doing this film here? And well, what is this all about? I'm trying to build bridges. I don't want to just talk to Christians. I want to talk to non-believers and tell them about Christ. Because someone did that for me. They came to my high school campus and they shared the gospel and kind of entered my weird little world. And I heard it and I understood it and I believed. And I want to do that for other people as well. Good insight from Pastor Greg Laurie today here on A New Beginning. And he comes back to close our study time in prayer in just a moment. Now, Pastor Greg mentioned his book, Lennon, Dylan, Alice, and Jesus. You can find out more about that book by going to our online store at harvest.org. Just click the store icon at the top of the page. Lennon, Dylan, Alice, and Jesus. You'll find it's a fascinating read. But listen, if you've never come into a relationship with the Lord, we'd invite you to do that today. It's just too important to put it off. Pastor Greg, what would you say to the listener who wants to make that change right now? What I would say is, he's only a prayer way, which means if you will call upon the name of the Lord right now through prayer, he will hear your prayer and answer your prayer. Listen, if you want Jesus Christ to come into your life, if you want him to forgive you of your sin, if you want to know that you'll go to heaven when you die, just pray this prayer right now after me. Just pray, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, but I know that you're the Savior who died on the cross for my sin and rose again from the dead. I turn from my sin now, and I choose to follow you from this moment forward as my Savior and Lord, as my God and my friend. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. And listen, if you have just prayed that prayer with Pastor Greg and have meant those words sincerely, the Lord has forgiven your sins, and we want to welcome you into God's family. And we want to help you get started living this new life. Let us send you Pastor Greg's New Believer's Bible. It's been read by millions of people, and they've enjoyed the scores of helps for new believers and the easy-to-understand translation. So get in touch for your free copy of the New Believer's Bible. You can call us at 1-800-821-3300. We can take your call anytime, again at 1-800-821-3300. Or write A New Beginning, Box 4000, Riverside, California, 92514. Or go online to harvest.org and click No God. Pastor Greg, let me ask you, what, what do parents need to know about what kids are facing today. You know, it's uh, Mm post-COVID, lockdowns, quarantines, Mm. all that, on top of all the pressures that kids normally face, Mm. on top of social media pressures and everything else. What would parents be surprised Mm. to know about the typical struggles that kids face? I think they would be surprised to know that their kids are really scared uh, that they are dealing with a level of stress that is unprecedented. And I'll tell you why. Social media has amplified everything to another level. And, and of course, they're dealing with self-worth issues. Mm. I was just taking my granddaughter to school, and I told her because she was meeting with some friends, and I know how strong peer pressure mm. is in school, especially in the teen years. And I just said to her, I want you to remember that you are a beautiful girl. You're very smart. You're very athletic. You love the Lord. I'm so proud of you. And don't ever worry about the approval of some other kid. Mm -hmm. I know it's really a big deal when you're in school. I know peer pressure is so strong. But as you get older, you really realize that it doesn't matter what other people think about you that much. So I think it's important to 
to affirm our children. Yeah. You know, I think as parents, so often we have to correct them. Hey, clean your room, wash your hands, do this, do that. Why didn't you do this better? There's a place for that, of course. It's called parenting. Mm. But on the other hand, there's a place for affirmation, for for encouragement, and and to reassure them. They need to know that God loves them, and they need to know that you love them, and that you're their biggest fan, and you're there rooting for them, and you need to take time for them. You know, it's been said the greatest thing you can spend on your children is time. Mm-hmm. And I know sometimes they'll say, well, I, I spend quality time with my children. Oh, that's nice. But actually, kids need quantity time, lots of it. And so involve yourself in the lives of your little ones, because before you know it, they will be grown, and, and they will be out of the house. And they will have all those memories. And I don't think you'll look back and say, I wish I hadn't spent so much time with my kids. I Mm -hmm. wish I hadn't talked to them so often. I -hmm. wish I had worked out more or I wish that I would had other hobbies that I did instead of doing that or, or even made more money. No, you'll realize those times you spent with your children are gold. Mm -hmm. So take time with your kids, affirm your kids, reassure your kids. Because they're living in a really scary world right now. Hmm. And we have a resource that could really help them in that regard. It's tied in with our new animated cartoon series. Uh, The new resource is called the Ben Born Again New Believers Growth Book. Uh, Tell them how they can put that into use in encouraging kids the right way. Yeah, well, the Ben Born Again New Believers Growth Book is a part of our our series that we're doing with these cartoon characters, including animation. In fact, we have an episode of Ben Born Again that's available on the Harvest Plus app that I hope you will all download, and it's called Don't Be Afraid, Mm. and it deals with fear. And it was written to address the fears of young people. It's Ben Born Again and Yellow Dog, and they're out in the ocean, and a giant wave comes, and they're both freaking out. In fact, here's a little audio sample of it. Outside, yellow dog! Big set coming! Ooh, isn't there a beginner's course around here? Don't worry, man. Don't be afraid. Oh, I'm not afraid. I'm just very, very, very concerned! Come on. We've got it. Oh, we don't got it. Jesus, help us! Amen. Look, that sushi's a little too fresh for me. Whew! Dude, that was insane! Yeah, well, the next wave coming is from me, waving goodbye to this ocean. (laughs) So Ben asks Yellow Dog, what are you afraid of? And Yellow Dog describes his fears, which includes vacuum cleaners, cats and strollers, (laughs) and... And other things, but eventually they get down to real fears that we all face in life. And Ben points Yellow Dog to Christ and trusting in the Lord. And when fear and worry encroaches, that we pray. But we hope people will watch that. It's called Don't Be Afraid on the Harvest Plus app. But back to the Ben Born Again New Believers Growth Book. So this is a printed resource that we have developed. It takes the basics of the Christian faith, the things that every Christian needs to know, including children, and presents them in a very friendly, entertaining way. Ben Born Again and Yellow Dog are woven throughout the resource, and it will be a blessing to your kids and your grandkids. And I would like to send you one of these for your gift of any size. And by the way, whatever you send will be used for us to continue to reach young people and older people too, of course, but to reach all people with the message of the gospel and the teaching of the Word of God. So order your copy of the Ben Born Again New Believers Growth Book. Yeah, that's right. We have it waiting for you. So just get in touch with an investment in sharing the gospel, and we'll say thanks by sending you the Ben Born Again New Believers Growth Book. Just call us anytime 24-7 at one 800 821-3300. That's 1-800-821-3300. Or write A New Beginning, Box 4000, Riverside, California, 92514. Or go online to harvest.org. 
Well, next time, Pastor Greg offers more how-to guidelines for sharing the gospel most effectively. But before we go, Pastor Greg closes our study in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Now, Father, use us to be your light in this dark world. There are so many people that don't know you. They don't know anything about you, and that seems like a bad thing, but in some ways it could be a good thing because there's no preconceived notions. They're kind of like a blank slate. And we have the answer, the powerful Word of God, the life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Lord, we want to give that message to as many people as possible. We commit ourselves to you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A New Beginning is a podcast made possible by Harvest Partners, helping people everywhere know God. If this show has impacted your life, share your story, leave a review on your favorite podcast app, and help others find hope.